Today, we are hitting Abram, faith and failure, Genesis chapter 12. A brief word on his name, Abram means basically the father of fill in the blank, which is a huge joke, as we will soon discover, because his, he has no kids. But later on in God's word, God comes in and gives Abram a new name, Abraham, which means the father of nations, the father of all nations. So throughout this lesson, I'm going to do my best to just keep calling him Abram. But when you grow up calling him Father Abraham, I might call him Abraham a couple times. So Abram, Abraham, same person. Um, This is just before God gave him a new name. We've been traveling along the book of Genesis now for quite a bit of time. And we are coming here in Genesis chapter 12 to a very unique and special time. I invite you uh, to open up, if you have a Bible, to just follow along in God's Word for yourself. Uh, On our website, fellowshipbarbersville.com, you can download um, our, uh, 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 our app or our notes and just be able to follow along with those as well, if you would like, or just take them as we go along. But in Genesis chapter 12, we arrive at a place that is different than the first 11 chapters. The first 11 chapters of Genesis are something we call historically proto-history. And what that means is it is truly ancient history. To give you an idea, by the time Abram was walking the earth, the Tower of Babel had happened a thousand years ago. It was a time of antiquity, and it is marked by the fact that there was and is to this day no surviving writing. If they had writing during the times of the first 11 chapters of Genesis, during the times of Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, Noah, and the Tower of Babel, we don't know about it. We are able to put trust in God's word in the account of the first 11 chapters because we recognize that the Lord delivered these things to Moses as he kind of gathered together all of the tales of the people of the earth um, at the Mount Sinai where he was kind of formulating the first five books of the Bible, the the Pentateuch. But uh, we arrive in Abram at chapter 12 and we arrive at a unique time in history. Writing has been developed. Between now, uh, this point, and the Tower of Babel, great nations have risen that are extraordinarily technologically advanced. Uh, We like to think of this time period as a time of savagery, of a time of, of this antiquity where Abram was just walking around with his sheep and his cattle and everybody was walking around with their sheep and cattle. But, and this is incredible. Archaeology has uncovered evidence that during this time period, there were vast civilizations. One example of them are the Minoans that predated the uh, Greeks that had technology thousands of 4,000 years ago that was not rediscovered until the twilight of the Roman Empire. These people were smart, and they were also evil. We read about some of the cities and some of the nations of this land. We read about Sodom and Gomorrah, which was a terrible place of crime and injustice. We read later in the book of Genesis that two angels appear, and the men of the town immediately want to take and, 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 and use them and abuse them and rape them. But then we see a little later in the chapter, we see like, this is, this is pretty terrible. What was Lot's, what was this other guy's answer to this? He was like, well, come rape my daughters. It was just as bad. It was terrible. It was, it was a place of evil. And the Lord said to, when Lord said to Abram, I will not destroy this place if you just find 10 good people. He couldn't find 10 good people, so he destroyed this place while saving the people who were still good. We even see in Egypt, later in this chapter, as Christine read, that Abram was so filled with fear that they would take and kill him because of his wife, that that must have been something that happened, is that if someone saw an attractive woman and saw that she was married, they'd just kill the man and say, well, now you're single, let's get married. Um, So it was a time of great moral depravity, something that we hadn't seen since the uh, great flood. It was a time of great learning, yes, great technology, yes, great evil, yes, but unlike the flood, God decided to, he chose to interact with humanity, to interact with us in a different way. And that's what brings us to the story of Abram. Christine has already read this passage this morning, so I would like to retell it in a more narrative format. The Lord came to Abram. And he made seven promises. He said, first, go 
to the land that I will show you, and I will do these things. I will bless you. I will make your name great. I will make you a blessing. I will make from you a great nation. All those that bless your name will be blessed. All those that curse your name will be cursed. And from you and in you, the entire earth, every family on this world forever will be blessed because of you. And so Abram, he did what the Lord asked him to do. He took his wife, who was barren. He took his, uh, at that point in time, heir, Lot, his nephew, all of his possessions, which were, he had some, but he wasn't by any means super wealthy. And they left. They left the land of his father, the land of his home, a place of comfort and ease and security, and traveled off. On the first leg of the journey, they stopped When they had just barely stepped their foot out of their land, the Lord manifested and appeared to Abram face to face. And he said, to you, excuse me, to your children, I will give all of this land. Abram fell on his knees. He built an altar. And the next leg of the journey, he was still overcome. So he built another altar. And we read that he invoked the name of the Lord. What that means is that he worshiped God, invoking the name of the Lord in that context and in that Hebrew means he invoked, he worshiped the name of the Lord. And then he continued his travel. But all of a sudden, trouble arose. This great promise that the Lord gave to Abraham was threatened because a famine came across the land. And so, in great fear and trembling, in order to save his own life, because if he died, these great promises would never happen, he Abram took his wife and he left the land and he went down to Egypt for no doubt he heard that there was food in Egypt because of the Nile. And yet, as he approached there, he, with increasing dread, realized that though his life was saved from maybe the famine, he might actually die because of how beautiful his wife is. And in a move that is eternally skeevy, he decided to ask his wife to just be his sister, pretend to be his sister, so he even acknowledges, you, you're safe, no matter what you're safe, but me, they're going to kill me, so pretend to be my sister, and we'll all be good. She came down, he came down, some young men saw how beautiful she was, when told their good old buddy Pharaoh, Pharaoh was like, all right, I want to marry her, and so he did. He paid an immense dowry to Abraham, made him a rich man, he took Sarah, and he lay with her. It says in Scripture that he made her his wife, took her into his home. That means there was infidelity in that. After that happened, a plague struck the land of Egypt, and Pharaoh recognized the fact that the plague was from the Lord. And so he said to, uh, or maybe not from the Lord, but from some higher power, he recognized the fact that what he did with this woman was wrong. And so he was able to deduce that this woman was not, in fact, Abram's sister, but his wife. So he said to Abram, go, take your wife, take all the stuff I gave you, and get out of this land. I don't want you here anymore. So Abram left. This is a remarkable story about an unremarkable man. Let's pray and let's get into God's word. Father God, I ask your blessing over your word that we might look at Abram, Abraham, and be amazed by your greatness in this troubled, fragile man. We love you and we thank you for choosing broken vessels like him, broken vessels like us. May your word be spoken with power power from your spirit, not from any human vocal cords, and I ask that you open the hearts and the minds of those here today so they might truly listen and truly draw closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. As I studied not just this chapter, but the story of Abram and Abraham, I came across something. This guy was, as I, as I wrote here, he was remarkably unremarkable. When we look throughout the entirety of Scripture, we see God using, yeah, maybe the dregs of society, but also people with great intellect, like Solomon, or great strength, like uh, strength and a will to lead, like King David, or great prophetic power, like Elijah, where he was able to prophesy and do all this cool stuff, or um, great eloquence of word, like the Apostle Paul. Uh, But when we look at Abraham, he was none of those things. His dad 
was an idol worshiper. Uh, in fact, we know that idol worshiping was so built into his family that two generations later, when his grandson Jacob returned to Abraham's father's house to find himself a wife, he found himself two, and one of them got them all in trouble by stealing her family's household idols. So literally, his grandson had a wife that still worshipped the old gods, these old false idol gods. Not just that, but Abram is shown up morally by a pagan prince of Egypt, this king of Egypt. Even this pagan, godless man was like, I'm not sleeping with your wife. This is wrong. Well, Abram was too much of a coward to say so. He wasn't righteous. In fact, we find later in his story after the battle um, with some kings, Abram encounters this, this, this grand priestly king called Mechizedek, which is just a mouthful. And Mechizedek was, and we see this in Hebrews as well in the New Testament, he was still a worshiper of the true God. So somehow this faith that passed from Adam and Eve to Cain and Abel to Noah still survived to this day. And Abram didn't have it. Nor do we see him particularly intelligent. Sure, he might have been able to figure some stuff out later in life. But think about this. This guy, he's a 70-plus-year-old man. If he doesn't have wits about him then, most of us would say he's not going to get any. He is not someone that is particularly impressive. And yet, God decided to enter human history, to step onto the stage of our lives, not through the great civilizations that existed through the day, or the great righteous high priests that existed in the day, but through this small, remarkably unremarkable man. And as I read this passage, I was struck, and I kept asking myself one question, why? Why did God choose Abram? by all human measurements and accounts, I would say even by divine accounts. <laughs> when you talk about morality and right and wrong and following the Lord, in the, even this chapter, he was a failure. He was no good, so why? And as we go through this passage, and as we finally look to the cross, I think we'll be able to see why that is. So let us revisit the first nine verses. The story of Abram's faith. The Lord approached Abram, and in this approach, we see the two pronged, the two uh, features of what true faith is. It is a promise and a request. The Lord promised Abram a great name to be blessing like 10,000 times, to have a great nation come out of him. All he had to do was go. A lot of us might wince at hearing that because we say to your, ourselves, well, we, we're not saved by our good works. We're saved by our, we're, we're saved by our faith. And the answer to that is true. We are saved by our faith just as Abraham was saved by his faith. But we also know, and we know this in the book of, book of James, faith without action is dead. We are saved by the Lord if we say yes, if we ask Jesus into our heart, if we accept him into us. In the same way the Lord said to Abram, go, and here's the remarkable thing. He didn't ask Abram to do something. It, it was difficult, but he did not ask Abram to do, come up with something brilliant or to overcome armies or to do any of these grand acts. He asked him to do something that parents ask their little kids to do every day. And, you know, shepherds ask their sheep to do every day. He said, go. And Abram's response, the response that echoes through history even today, is Abram said, okay. He took his wife. He took his heir. And he left to go to the land where the Lord had, caused him, had called him. And in just that smallest step of faith, the Lord rewarded Abram monumentally. In all the commentaries I read, people talked about how great this reward was, that when he reached this first leg of his journey, the Lord appeared to him and said, I'm going to give your son that land. And, we, and all these commentaries, everyone was like, wow, he gets all this land? And I was like, wow, he got to see God? He got to come face to face with the Lord. And it is at that moment that this nobody pagan loser is changed because we see him do something. First he builds an altar and then he travels on a little bit more. And no doubt while he was traveling, he was considering and thinking and praying 
And what does he do when he gets to his next step of the journey? He builds an altar. And he doesn't just build an altar, which was a very pagan thing to do, you know, just build an altar and, you know, make it all nice and good. He invoked the name of the Lord. He worshiped God. You know, something interesting about the Old Testament is that there is no real mention. There is hints and, and maybe thin uh, 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 unveilings, but there is no real strong teaching in the Old Testament about heaven or hell. In fact, such was so that many uh, Jewish theologians really believed that all there was was the, was, was the here and the now, which personally I think makes their faith so remarkable because they weren't doing this stuff because they were trying to get into heaven or anything like that. They weren't trying to play that game. But I remember one day hearing a story of a kid, well, a college kid talking to his, his professor in seminary. And, and he said, Professor, if God, God never promised Abram that he would go to heaven, we never see him promise that. So how do we know he's there? And the professor said to the, 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 the young man, the professor said, well, we read in Scripture three times that Abram and Abraham was God's friend. Once we even hear God saying, Abraham, you are my friend. And if Abraham's God's friend, where else would he go? He's his friend. You see, when Abraham met God, everything was swept away. It was no longer a tale of idols and idolatry. It was no longer a tale of good deeds and altar building. It was a tale of two people, him and God. The relationship was formed. He became friends to God. And though we, the children of the Lord, are called something even greater than friend, we are called sons and daughters we know our faith is secure, not because the Lord has made us a promise, but because he has called us to be his kids, and his kids aren't going to be left out in the cold. In the same way, Abram enters into this magnificent relationship with the Lord that is full of worship, and his faith is counted to him, we read later in the writings of Paul, as righteousness. He was not a good man, but because he believed the Lord and responded with the faith like a child, which Christ calls us to do, with the faith of a sheep, like Christ calls us to do, his world was changed. But, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, that was not the end of the story. We read in the next 20 verses about one of the quickest turnarounds in Scripture. There might be quicker, but it's hard to find. So he has this magnificent, amazing experience, this monumental, he meets God face to face, God intercedes in history, and for the first time in a thousand years, God says anything after humanity basically damned itself by building the Tower of Babel and saying, I will do this, I will do this. God comes to the scene, and God says, no, I will do this, I will do this. He changes Abram's life, he promises the moon and back, he promises everything, and then Abram gets hungry. And a famine strikes, and Abram fell in the way we all fall. He began to get scared. If God promised me all these things, how, how will I be able to fulfill these things? How can, how can God fulfill these promises if I die of hunger? How is that possible? I'm not going to be able to do that. It is the fear you and I feel every time we have a desire to sin. Sin I really feel is, is an extension of our distrust of God. I don't trust God to fulfill his promises to me, so I'm going to try and fulfill it in something else. I don't trust that truth is good enough, so I'm going to try and lie. I'm not going to trust that my spouse it will fulfill me, so I'm going to try lust. I'm not going to trust that God is going to give me my daily bread, so I'm going to trust in gluttony. I'm not going to trust that the Lord will bless my work, so I'm just going to be lazy and not work at all. That is the fear that works within us. And so Abram was like, I gotta, I gotta do God's plan. God has given me a mission, and what does he do? He immediately breaks the one thing God asked him to do. God said, go to this land. Abraham's like, yes, I will. He goes to the land, then he gets hungry. He's like, I'm not gonna go to this land anymore, and he moves to Egypt. So immediately, Abram breaks faith with God. God made a promise. He had a request. Abram showed the smallest amount of faith, and then broke it. And not just that. What do we call Abram? We call him Father Abraham. There's even a little song about it. He is called not just the father of the Jewish people, but the father of Islam, the father of Christianity. We see in the New Testament that he is called the father of the faith. 
Christ is the cornerstone. Christ is all this, but, but, but the, the, the New Testament authors look at Abraham as this founder, this great forefather, the patriarch of what we believe. And then he did a bad dad thing. He decided to save his own skin and sell off his wife. If he wasn't a good husband, he wasn't going to be a good dad. Is this the guy God chose to be the father of the nations? Is this the guy who would one, name, one day go from Abram to Abraham, which means father of all nations? Is he supposed to be the guy that's going to, we are going to use an example of our faith? He, out of fear, oh my gosh, I escaped the hunger, but now they're going to kill me because my wife's good looking. So I'm just going to say she's my sister. How could that possibly go wrong? And it immediately went wrong because it was his plan. But he got a chance. We see later in uh, Genesis that when Lot is captured by enemy kings, Abram's like, this won't do. Let's raise an army and let's kill everybody. But when his wife is taken, he's like, oh, I'll take the sheep. What a, what a little wimpy man. And what is brutal is his wife is taken and she has no voice. We don't know if she agreed or disagreed, but I think if she doesn't have a voice, some commentator said, that probably means she was okay with it. I'm like, that's not what I've heard about people getting their voices taken away. She was taken. She was, for, by all accounts, raped by Pharaoh while her husband grew rich. You know, in this account, I remember reading this when I was a child and being like, why did God bless Abraham by giving him all this stuff? And that was a very American thing for me to think because I'm like, oh, he's got stuff. He was obviously blessed. But we immediately see several chapters later, all of this stuff causes huge problems for Abraham. It causes friction with his nephew Lot, which eventually leads Lot to Sodom and Gomorrah, which eventually leads Lot to losing his wife and having an incestuous affair with his daughters. Just a crazy thing that is brought on by the curse of this wealth. And we have no idea how his and Sarah's relationship was after this, but we don't really see them being good to each other. They are bossy to each other. They're scolding. Sarah laughs literally at God. We, Sarah, Sarah's name becomes Sarah, which means she who laughs, which sounds sweet until you realize she was laughing at God. And everything changed because of what this did. And what was that last promise that God promised to Abraham? He promised that he would be a blessing to all nations. But what happened? He became a curse, a plague, because of his lies descended upon the land. And this pagan, sun-worshipping Pharaoh was like, this is wrong, you gotta go. By every possible measure, Abram failed. He broke faith, he broke family, he broke his covenant with the land. In sin, we see all four of our relationships falling within Abraham. His relationship with himself, he became a sniveling idiot, fool. He was broken. His relationship with God was blasted. We do not see him and God talking to each other. His relationship with his wife and his family and with Pharaoh was destroyed, obviously, and the land was struck because of him. Everything was destroyed, but here is the gospel within this story. Through all of this, we see one thing. This is what we see. God doesn't leave. Abram's wicked. Abram's foolish. Abram breaks his faith. But God doesn't leave. For those of you here today, in sin and in fear and in hurt, know this. God doesn't leave. His goodness is based, and I'm going to use the word predicated, on God's righteousness, not Abram's righteousness. And it is here that we see the gospel in the story of Abram. Because the truth of the matter is, is that God has interacted with us in a way that is very similar to Abram. In terms of faith, he has given us a promise. Follow me, and I will what? I will give you eternal life. I will give you rest. I will forgive your sins. I will transform who you are. Follow me. So we have that call, that two-pronged call of faith, the promise and the request. And for those of us who say simply, yes, Lord, I choose to accept you as my Lord and Savior, we become sharers of that promise. For those of you who are here today, or who are listening online who have not made that yet, guys, guess what? It doesn't matter who you are or where you've been. That is what the Lord is asking for you. It's like a child, just say, yes, Dad, I will, and your life will be changed forever. 
we also see that the Lord has called us to do a work, not for our salvation, but after our salvation. The Lord called Abram to continue to move, even after Abram has moved. And in a way, God asks us the same thing he asked Abram. He said to Abram, go. And he says to us, uh, during, his, um, uh, during his last day on earth, he says to us, go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I, like I said earlier, I work with the, uh, the youth group, and one of the things I've encountered over the last several years is a lot of fears from some of the older kids about what God's plan is for their life. Sorry, this wire just keeps getting mixed up. Is God's plan for them to go to WVU? My answer is never. <laughs> I kid, I kid, I kid. Is God's plan for them to go to a trade school or to start work? What's God's plan for their life? I even remember when I was, you know, a senior, I'm like, why does God want for my life? As if, you know, if I went to the wrong school, God would be like, oh, that's it. I guess you're going to hell now, or whatever. Like, like as, as if that was what was going to happen. And I also see in a lot of parents a lot of fear. Like, I, what happens if, if my kid goes out of God's will? You know, if, if they go to a college they shouldn't go to, or maybe study a major they shouldn't study. And I'm like, what, what major? <laughs> Satanism? I don't, I don't know what major you could be talking about. And there's, there's this fear and there's this, this concern. And that is why God laid down his plan so great for us. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. And one thing this church does fantastically that I have discovered, having come here and spent actually this week, three years here, and it is that this church has done that. We are sending Kyle and Abigail, Greg's uh, daughter and son-in-law, to France with their little baby trip and their little baby to come. We, uh, have, we sent Nathaniel Wall to Utah to preach to the Mormons. We sent money and supplies and people to Elder Robinson in his inner city um, um, Baltimore ministry. We have people all around the world who are serving the Lord. But I'm going to tell you something about that verse. I had to study that verse about five years ago for a lesson I did at BCM, and what I discovered changed my faith. It changed the way I look at the Great Commission. It changed everything in my life, because that verse is tragically mistranslated. Go, therefore, good translation, good translations. Go and make disciples of all nations, fine translation. But what it actually literally says is as you go, make disciples. What's the difference? The difference is that there are not goers and senders. There are not people who are staying around and not doing anything, and people who are going. All of us are called to, as we go to work, to school, to class, to our clubs and our teams and our practices, as we go, we are to make disciples of all nations. Let me tell you a secret that nobody told me before I came, became a pastor. Pastors are not on the front lines. I have found something remarkable, that the moment someone finds out I'm a pastor, they stop cussing. They stop doing a lot of stuff. They're like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Pastor Jacob, or whatever. I'm just like, dude, I'm just getting Starbucks. Don't worry about it. They start talking differently to us. And I once asked, Greg, they start like saying like, oh, my faith, my grandma, I'm a Christian, all this stuff. And they start talking just really weird stuff a lot of the times. And I want to ask Greg, I'm like, how do you do with that? And Greg says, well, you know, what I usually say is that I'm a, um, like, I, I work on people's relationships, because that's what I do. I'm a pastor. I work on their relationship with each other, with God. He's like, I think that's been, always been a great thing for me. I'm like, that's great. So one day I was at my, uh, I was getting my hair cut, and <laughs> the, the woman asked me, so what do you do? And I'm like, well, I work with youth, and I'm just going to say what Greg said. I'm like, well, I'm a teenage relationship specialist. And she was like, what is that? I'm like, oh, that sounds so weird. Uh, I'm a youth pastor. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was like, this is, oh, that was really creepy. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Ew. Um, and so, and then she immediately started talking to me different. When someone comes to church, it's usually not because the pastor invited them. When someone comes to church, usually it's because a friend or family member said, come to church today. Though we read in the New Testament about how the church exploded outward, and it was because of the hard work of the missionaries, the men and the women who left their homes and left their families and spread out across the world, once they got to a place, the real work began. And the real work were those small house churches of people who were bakers, who were masoners, who were just your average, everyday Joe and Jane, and they changed the world. 
We read about the Apostle Paul and Peter and all the greats. But in the book of life, at the very top, are the names of those silent saints we've never heard of who did nothing more than say, Sister, come to church with me today. Or, friend, you're hurting. Come with me. And so God's plan isn't some grand plan for the missionaries and the pastors. It's a plan for you. But if you're like me, and if you're like most people, you're afraid to mess that plan up like Abraham was. Abraham was a super afraid to mess that plan up. And in that fear, he started doing his things his own way. And I bet you there's a lot of people here today or listening that have been hurt by Christians or churches who tried to do God's plan their own way. If we look throughout history, there have been so many people brutalized because they tried to do God's plan their way. I remember talking to my dad once after something crazy happened at a local church, and I'm like, that's crazy. He's like, Jacob, that happens all the time, everywhere. And I'm like, are you serious? That's terrible. He's like, it's just what happens. But luckily, the Lord has given us two things by which we might not just know what his plan is, but know how his plan is to be carried out. First, we have the Lord's word, which gives us hope and reassurance in our own place in God's plan, as well as a guide to showing us the failures and the successes of those who've come before. But second, and this is what I want to really concentrate on today, he gave us the Holy Spirit who bears something. It bears fruit in our lives. How are we supposed to go and make disciples of all nations? baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. This is how we go. We go with love, and with joy, with peace, with patience, and kindness, and faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control, and one more I'm forgetting right now, but the Lord will forgive me. It's okay. Guys, so often do I hear youth say, how can I change the world? No one's going to listen to me. I'm just a kid. Older people don't listen to me. They tell me to shut up. I observe those who are adults they want to serve the Lord, but they're working. They got bills to pay, they got mouths to feed, they got kids to raise, they got spouses to love, and the world's falling apart, and they can't do it. And then I speak to the elderly. They look past and they look at their life and their past, and their hearts break. If only I was better with my kids, they wouldn't have turned out that way. If only I would have loved the Lord stronger and done better, He would have used me in much greater ways. But this is the power of the gospel. That we are not called to be King David's conquering lands, nor are we called to be uh, um, the great Apostle Paul writing scripture and with great words of eloquence and knowledge and wisdom. We're called to allow the fruits of the spirits to manifest in our life. And by allowing these fruits to manifest, just by being loving, by being kind, by being patient, by being these things, we make disciples of all nations. And it is a wonderful, powerful beautiful thing. So, why did God finally choose Abram? Let's return to that question. Why did God choose Abram? And as I struggled with that, and then I looked at it through the lens of Christ, I realized the answer was staring me in the face the whole time. You see, Abram wasn't the only one that failed miserably. I think of the night Jesus was betrayed. He had his closest friends, his heart he was poured out to them. He literally established a new covenant in which they would no longer be known as just the, the people of Israel, but as sons and daughters of the living God. And he takes them to his private place of prayer and he says, pray with me, and they fall asleep. And then the guards come and they run away. And then his right-hand man, the man he said he would build his church on, Peter, he goes and a little, tiny, pint-sized servant girl comes up and says, hey, aren't you a friend of Jesus? And he goes, no. Again, aren't you a friend of Jesus? No. A third time, I could have sworn you were a friend of Jesus. And Peter goes, I swear on all that is holy, on my mama's grave, I have no idea who you're talking about. (sighs) You want to talk about Judas? I want to talk about Peter. What Judas did was wrong, but what Peter did, he's twisting the knife. And yet, what did Jesus do? He did not leave. One of the first things he did when he rose was appear to the disciples and break bread with them. And Peter, what did he do to this man that hurt him deeper than maybe anyone else had hurt him? He woke up, he met him on the shore, and he cooked him breakfast. 
And he said, I love you. Do you love me? Three times, do you love me? Peter said, yes. Then feed my sheep and clothe my sheep. The Lord did not leave Peter. The Lord chose Abram because he wanted to prove to us at the very beginning that he can and will choose you. Are there any here who are mighty kings, who are great rulers, who are wise beyond their years, or are we a room full of messed up people, a people where we are remarkably unremarkable? You know, I don't think it's a big surprise that all the rich and famous and powerful people aren't believers, because when you get to that position, so often you like to think of yourself as better, when in reality, the truth of the gospel is we're not. We are sinful, we're broken, we're screw-ups, we're mess-ups, we're Abraham, we are bad husbands, we are bad wives, we are bad children, we are bad parents. We are people who, when entrusted with the gospel, we fumble it, we drop it, we break it, we walk away from it, we make mistakes, we hurt God, we betray Jesus, we say, I don't know who that is, but God doesn't leave. He loves us, and He stays. He has given us a plan to, as we go, make disciples. He has given us a way to do that. And what's amazing is that his way isn't even us. It's the Holy Spirit. It's to be a loving, kind person at the best we can do. And what is our reward? Maybe we became Christians beginning because we were like, I I don't want to go to hell. Totally legitimate reason not to, to, I mean, totally legitimate reason to become a Christian. Or maybe we said, I want to go to heaven. Totally legitimate reason. But we move on in our faith so that one day we might get the pure, great um, reward of Abram, which is the Lord did look at him and say, well done, good and faithful servant. One day we will see God face to face. And the great giants of the faith that we look at, the older they get, two things became apparent. One, they, moved, they fell more in love with Jesus. And two, they fell more out of love with themselves. And so brothers and sisters, today, wherever you're at. Maybe you are Abram, pre-conversion, an idol worshiper, a a nobody, a nobody from nowhere who will never leave your impact on the earth. Maybe you are recently brought to the faith and you are feeling this mountaintop experience, but you know there's a valley coming and you know that your failures, your addictions, your pains are just around the corner. Or maybe you're an old, old Christian and you've been at this game for a while and you're like, there is no, I have failed so much, God's gone. There's no way the Lord can use me. Let me tell you what the Lord revealed to Abram every single point of the way. I have not left you. I am here. My promise remains. And one day you will see me face to face.